In this Research Methods podcast, we are going to be talking about experimental design. Through the podcast, I'm going to focus on four key questions. First, what's an experiment? That is, how does it differ from other research? Second, when should we conduct one? Third, why should we conduct one? And fourth, is experimental design necessarily qualitative or quantitative? In a lot of cases, we don't typically consider experimental design as part of social science. When we think of experiments, we often think of lab experiments. We think of product development, so testing a seatbelt innovation, for example. Or we even think of Howard Wolowitz from the Big Bang Theory getting ready to send new, some new gadget into space. But in social science research, experiments can be an invaluable tool to help m make sure that if we're developing a new campaign, if we're placing a new product, if we're reaching out to particular stakeholders, that our messaging and our approach are effective. So I want to borrow from one of my old professor's campaigns that he had worked on and he had developed alongside of a number of his colleagues, and this was the Radio Diaries. Its purpose was to reduce HIV social stigma in Africa. When he was doing this research in the early 2000s, the estimated percentage of adults with HIV ranged from 15 to 49 percent of the whole adult population in these countries. And you can see the color coding right there. So to say that HIV is a major problem in Sub-Saharan Africa is a bit of an understatement, quite frankly. But the problem surrounding being HIV positive is really that it has a super strong negative social stigma all across Sub-Saharan Africa. And the stigma would manifest in a couple of ways. For kids, in a lot of cases, they weren't told. They weren't treated. In some cases, they would be disinherited. So there were really few legal protections afforded to children, so they weren't getting the medication. And certainly, if they knew about it, they weren't getting any help. The worst case was that they didn't know about it, and so they could easily potentially spread it to other folks. For adults, the, there are a number of nations in Sub-Saharan Africa that have very stringent anti-homosexual laws. So regardless of whether someone was LGBT or not, being HIV positive was associated with being gay or lesbian. So this meant that people typically didn't come forward for treatment because they were afraid of legal reprisals. But even if the question wasn't about whether they were gay or straight, they would face job discrimination or even being cast out of their social circles. So what this means is that the social stigma not only was masking whether or not people had HIV, they didn't know or they wouldn't say, but it meant that risky behaviors were more likely to be engaged, the spread of it was, was growing, and people weren't getting the treatment that they needed. So in order to tackle HIV, the spread of HIV in Africa, one of the reasons that they had to start with social stigma was because that was really affecting whether or not people would come forward. In Malawi, where the Radio Diaries was conducted, to put a little pr bit of perspective on this, one in 14 people at the time were HIV positive. Certainly, this was the leading cause of death among adults. And the government, though, had invested in prevention and treatment campaigns. The problem was, because of the social stigma, it just wasn't working. The biggest barrier to the campaign success was the negative social stigma, not at the governmental level in this case, but at the personal community kind of level. So the researchers from Johns Hopkins were brought in and, and asked to tackle this problem of the, social, the negative social stigma. One of their solutions was the Radio Diaries campaign. Why the radio? You know, this was in 2000, and, and for those of you who are alive in 2000, the radio still was yester centuries kind of technology but not so much in sub-Saharan Africa. The radio at the time was still the primary means of news, sports, entertainment. So it was easy and inexpensive for people to carry around small radios, big radios, it didn't really matter. So the Radio Diaries campaign was a regular TV or radio show that featured people talking about life with HIV and, and trying to humanize it, put a relatable face on them. Now, 
as an experiment, they needed to make sure that it was set up effectively. So one of the nice things about radio is that you can control the strength of the broadcast signal, so it didn't necessarily go everywhere. There were 30 villages involved with the, the experiment. Ten of the villages, people only listened to the radio diaries. In ten of the villages, people listened and discussed the radio diaries. So everyone would get together um, in a community center, the show would be played, and then be invited to discuss their reactions, their thoughts. And then ten villages listened to a control program. So that means it had nothing to do with HIV, nothing to do with these people's lives. They just got together and listened to a radio program so that they were doing the same kind of task over and over. So the question then is, did the radio diaries help? Well, they measured four stigma outcomes with this. First was the fear of casual contact. You know, as we know, you can't get HIV from just casual day-to-day -day contact, but this was one of the myths that was still surrounding HIV at the time. A second stigma outcome was shame, how badly people felt about their HIV status, or if they weren't HIV positive, what kind of shame did they feel that those who were HIV positive were likely to experience? Third, how much blame and judgment those without HIV would have on those who would, the perception of, of that. And then fourth, they would be asked, if you were HIV positive, would you be willing to disclose it? So it's four ways that we can think of social stigma. These were based on previous research about what are the biggest examples or ways that social stigma will manifest, particularly surrounding disease and HIV in particular. So the outcomes. Well, in terms of the four stigma outcomes, the fear of casual contact was reduced by the intervention. So those who listened to the radio diaries were less worried about getting HIV from casual contact. The shame, though, was a bit more complex. It was reduced, but only for those who did not have a close friend or relative with HIV. But shame wasn't reduced any more when there was discussion afterwards versus just listening to the radio program in and of itself. So what this suggests, which is interesting, is that there was a bit of a bias. The closer you were to someone who is HIV positive, the more your attitude could be affected. In terms of blame and judgment, it reduced blame for men. Unfortunately, it didn't reduce blame for women. So men who were HIV positive were viewed as, as, as less at fault for being HIV positive. Unfortunately, the same was not true for women. But it did also, regardless of whether younger participants were male or female, it did reduce the blame that would be placed on the young. However, it did not reduce blame on older participants. So we see both a gender and an age impact. So men got the best end of the deal, and there was a lot more empathy for the younger participants. The willingness to disclose HIV status, there wasn't a clear connection at that point. So the question is, was the radio diary successful? In the big picture, we could argue yes, but not fully. When there were indications that three of the four forms of social stigma were positively influenced, at least to some degree, it gave us the indication that this was an experiment that was worth pursuing in a much broader scale. And so Malawi instituted the radio diaries as a way of helping to reduce social stigma. Now, is it perfect? Of course not. But the question is, from an, a research design perspective, what can we learn from the radio diaries? And so this is where we come into experimental design and scientific investigation. One of the most important elements to anything that's scientific, whether we're talking hard sciences or social sciences, is that science has to be reliable and repeatable. This means that if I were to go into any population, 
who were similar enough so they relied on the radio or whatever my mode of communication was, that I should be able to replicate the same kind of information, the same radio diaries kind of a program where people were sharing their perspectives and test it to see whether or not it worked. So what makes experiments reliable and repeatable? Well, first, they're going to be based on good research questions or hypotheses. You have to be able to test. So in this case, the question was, is radio diaries an effective way to address social stigma amongst a population where social stigma for HIV is really high? Second, there has to be a controlled environment for experimental groups and control groups. So you notice in the three groups that were used, 10 of the villages heard the radio diaries, 10 of the villages heard the radio diaries plus had this discussion, and 10 just listened to some other radio show. The 10 listening to the other radio show were the control group. That meant that they weren't exposed so that if people had a change in attitudes, you could directly attribute that to the radio diaries and not just the act of listening to the radio together as a way of being more social. It was also trying to figure out whether or not, you know, because listening to the radio or watching television is often social. We watch a program with, with our friends or we all know that we watch the same program and then we talk about it. So being able to differentiate between exposure to the radio program and having no immediate conversation about it versus conversation also meant that we could start to see what affected, if anything. So this means that we're able to test the effects of an independent variable on a dependent variable. So our dependent variables in this case were those four social stigma outcomes. The independent variable was the experiment. It had th the three levels of the independent variable. So the control group, the experiment with the radio diaries alone, and the ex experiment, the radio diaries plus the discussion. So does the introduction of the radio diaries influence each of the types of social stigma? That's what we mean when we say that they're able to test the effects of an independent variable on a dependent variable. What also makes experiments reliable and repeatable is that you reduce bias whenever possible. This meant that across all of the villages, they heard the same radio program at the same time of day and under the same kinds of conditions. So they, even though you're talking about different people, different villages, you're trying to make sure that the conditions that they're being exposed to are as consistent. And then finally, that the procedure itself needs to be repeatable. So they did this over several different shows. They, it wasn't just a one-off. They had several episodes of the Radio Diaries that they listened to over the course of, of a year. I believe it was a weekly program. And so this means that over time, you get the same procedure. It's the same everything. So you know, hopefully, what's causing the impact if there is any on the dependent variable and what isn't. So if we think about this in terms of the elements of a controlled experiment, we always, w the ideal experiment have two groups, the experimental group, which is the group receiving the treatment, and a control group, which is one that's identical to the experimental group, but they just don't receive the treatment. Think about it in terms of the medical test, the control groups get the placebo, the sugar pill, the experimental group gets the medication. In addition, you want to try and make sure that the factors are consistent between the control and the experimental groups. So you want to have people of similar makeup, whether that's gender, whether it's age. So if you have 10 men participating, you also want to have 10 men participating in the, the experimental group as well as the control group. Likewise, similar ages, similar characteristics. So the more similar your groups can be, the more effective you are doing it controlling those factors that can influence people's attitudes, people's assumptions about, about the world, really. So it also means that you want to decide what you change. Typically, in 
experiments, there's a single variable. It's the introduction of a medicine. In our case, it's the introduction of a particular campaign message most often. So you decide what you're going to manipulate. Now notice, there are independent variables that we can manipulate. Things like what message that someone's exposed to, but obviously there are other independent variables like our gender, our age, our socioeconomic status that you can't. So when we're talking about independent variables in this context, we're talking about ones like what message you're exposed to, not any of the, the, so, the socioeconomic status identity factors. Then we also have the dependent variable. So what's measured over the course of the experiment? A little memory aid, I choose the IV. The dependent variable depends upon what the IV is being tested. Make sure that you want to, you separate the independent variables, the causal, and the dependent depends on the cause. So make sure that you have a clear sense of what your IVs and your DVs are in a controlled experiment. But there are certainly different types of data that you can collect. Most often we associate experimental design with quantitative or numerical based data. However, qualitative data can be really valuable in understanding. So for example, if you were doing focus group based interviews, you could introduce a particular campaign message to, a focus, to one particular discussion group. And you could see how people reacted to it, whether they liked it, whether they didn't like it. But ideally, you should have at least one other focus group who is of similar composition, who was exposed to either a control message or just no message at all. So you can use experimental design with focus groups really effectively. You can do it with one-on-one -on -one interviews. You can do it across a range of different qualitative methods of data collection. But so it's answering questions like, how does it feel? What's going on? What's it like? Quantitatively, obviously we're looking for numerical data. And so it's answering questions like how much, how often, or how many? So if you're wanting to implement a campaign, a lot of times we do the quantitative because we're interested in seeing what is the likelihood that if someone's exposed to the message that we've created, are they going to be likely to talk positively about our brand? buy something from us, come back to our website, whatever the outcome might be. So we want to know how much, how often, so that we can predict the return on investment and show profitability out of the campaign objectives. So no matter whether you're trying to understand what would make a message effective or ineffective versus how much of a message, how much impact the message would be, Experimental design can be useful no matter the qualitative or the quantitative kind of data. But what's critical with experimental design is validity and reliability. Certainly with all research, these are concerns that we have. So validity is a construct that can be backed up by a lot of different trials with similar kind of data. So we have a valid conclusion when we know that over the course of a number of different people, a number, number of different incidents, that this is true, that our finding is consistent and that it works. So in the radio diaries, having a weekly program over the course of a year and then testing to see what people's attitudes were meant that we could have a lot of different trials with the same kind of data. Reliability, on the other hand, is saying that no matter who runs it, you use the same procedure. So we know that if we're so setting up the radio diaries, they're going to be going at the same time of day, in the same kind of conditions, and the same situation. So no matter who runs it, we have confidence that it would work, that it's not just idiosyncratic to the way I do something, the way that you do something. Experimental design is good for not only controlling the manipulation or what you're testing, but also in terms of, of ensuring the validity and the reliability of the measures. So it's about transparency and it's about good aligned research.